Have you ever wondered how some of the most complex problems can be solved efficiently with dynamic programming? With this video, I want to give you insight into the fascinating world of dynamic programming. But first of all, what is dynamic programming? According to Wikipedia, dynamic programming is both a mathematical optimization and a computer programming method. The method was developed by Richard Bellman in the 1950s and has found applications in numerous fields. By the way, Richard Bellman is the same person who developed the Bellman-Ford algorithm, which is a widely used algorithm for finding the shortest path in a graph with weighted edges. Now assume you have some problem that you want to solve algorithmic. Assume you solve this problem with a recursive algorithm. In this case, you could try to use the dynamic programming technique. This will result in a more efficient algorithm if the previous algorithm repeated the computation of already calculated computations. Dynamic programming can help to avoid redundant calculations by reusing the results of previously computed subproblems, leading to significant speedups. When implementing dynamic programming, there are typically two approaches top down and bottom up. On the one side, the top-down approach, also known as memoization, involves breaking the problem down into subproblems and solving each subproblem recursively while storing the results. On the other side, the bottom-up approach involves solving the subproblems iteratively, starting with the smallest subproblem and building up to the final solution. Both the top-down and bottom-up approaches in dynamic programming can lead to more efficient algorithms depending on the specific problem and implementation details. The top-down approach is often more intuitive and easier to understand, but may suffer from stack overflow issues due to the recursion depth. On the other hand, the bottom-up approach is often more efficient and can avoid the overhead associated with recursion. So remember that if you come up with a recursive algorithm to solve a problem, then you can apply memoization to maintain the recursive property while storing the solutions to smaller subproblems. On the other hand, the bottom up approach avoids recursion altogether by solving the subproblems iteratively and building up to the final solution. For this video, I chose the famous problem of the calculation of a Fibonacci number that we will solve with dynamic programming as an example. We will start with a motivation of the Fibonacci sequence and then we will pass smoothly over to the recursive implementation of a function that returns the end Fibonacci number. In the next part we will investigate the problem in terms of efficiency of this implementation. Afterwards we will solve this problem with a memoization and with a bottom-up approach. Furthermore I want to show you also a space-saving implementation to solve this problem. So an implementation that uses less memory. Last but not least, I will provide an overview of the time and space complexities of all discussed algorithms and share some calculated results with you. So let us start with the question of what the Fibonacci numbers actually are. Consider the following square, where each edge has a length of 1. Thus the area of this square is exactly 1 squared. Now we place the same square next to this square. We then place a square with an edge length of 2 above these two squares. The area of this square is obviously 2 squared. To the left of this set of squares we place now another square with an edge length of 3 and accordingly an area of 3 squared. We continue now in exactly the same way. It is worth noting here that a very famous spiral, the so-called golden spiral, is formed by connecting the opposite corners of these squares with each other in a continuous spiral. But how do the Fibonacci numbers fit now into this picture? The answer lies in the fact that the Fibonacci numbers are precisely the sequence of numbers that we square to obtain the area of each square. We denote the i Fibonacci number here as f index i. We can observe that each Fibonacci number is the sum of its two preceding numbers. So we see 1 plus 1 is equal to 2, 1 plus 2 is equal to 3, 2 plus 3 is equal to 5, 3 plus 5 is equal to 8, 5 plus 8 is equal to 13, 8 plus 13 is equal to 21, and so on. 
It's worth mentioning here that in general the Fibonacci sequence starts with the number 0. Our next goal is to derive a recursive implementation of a function that returns the nth Fibonacci number. Since each number is the sum of its predecessors, we can construct the following recursion tree. Here we can observe that each parent node in the tree is the sum of its two child nodes. Moreover, we see that f of n is equal to f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 2. In the base case, when the input is equal to 0 or to 1, we define the output as 0 or 1, respectively. You can see here an example of a recursive implementation of a function that returns the n Fibonacci number in Python and that also uses this observation. Well, so this is a quite simple implementation to calculate the n Fibonacci number in Python. So we define the function as f of n and basically we check if n is equal to 0 or to 1 and in this case we return n. Otherwise, we return the sum of the Fibonacci number n minus 1 and the Fibonacci number n minus 2, which we obtain recursively. But now there is a problem with this function in terms of efficiency. This is because this implementation repeats the computation of already calculated solutions. As you can see here, for example, we have calculated the value f of 2 twice. We will consider this problem now with a larger example so that you can see exactly how serious this problem and this implementation is. We will now visualize the recursion tree for the call of f of 8 in order to illustrate the problem in this implementation. While calling the function with an input parameter that is equal to 8, the function first checks whether the input is equal to 0 or to 1. Since this is not the case, it proceeds with the execution of line 4 in the code and returns the sum of f of n minus 1 and f of n minus 2. To add f of n minus 1 and f of n minus 2 together, the function will start with the calculation of f of n minus 1 first. So in the next step we call f of 7. Again we check the base case, which is not fulfilled, and proceed with the execution of the code in line 4. We continue in this way until we finally reach the case where the input is equal to 0 or to 1. Once this is the case, then we return 1 or 0. If we add now the determined values f of 1 on the left and f of 0 on the right together, we get the value f of 2. By now, we have calculated f of 2. In order to calculate now f of 3, we have to add f of 2 and f of 1 together. Because the input is equal to 1, we are in the base case and we return 1. Finally, we can finish the function call f of 3 by adding f of 2 and f of 1 together. Now we have calculated f of 3. For the calculation of f of 4, we have to add f of 3 and f of 2 together, so we have to compute f of 2 again. Here we have to compute f of 1 and f of 0 once again, and add them together to finally obtain the value f of 2. Once we have done this, we can finally finish the function call of f of 4 by adding f of 3 and f of 2 together. According to this principle, the recursion tree will now be built up further.
Well, now let's consider the orange values, which represent the value f of 2. We can see that in order to calculate the final result, we have computed this value way too often. And the same applies also to f of 3, f of 4, f of 5 and f of 6. The idea behind the memoized version of this implementation is now to store the computed values in an array the first time they are calculated. In this way we can avoid recalculating them again in the future and instead we can access them immediately from the array. Let me show you this in more detail with a smaller example. We will calculate now the sixth Fibonacci number using the memoized implementation. First of all, we create an array that will store all calculated Fibonacci numbers. For the base cases we can already enter the values here. Similar to the last example, we call now f of 5, f of 4 and so on until we reach a stage where we are in the base case. Once we have calculated then f of 2, we store this value at the corresponding position in the array. We proceed in the same way with f of 3, by storing this value in the array once it has been calculated. To calculate f of 2, we have the choice of either recalculating the entire corresponding recursion subtree or using the stored value from the array. Since our goal is to save time and increase efficiency, we will use the value from the array instead of recalculating the corresponding recursion subtree. Next we have to calculate f of 5. To calculate f of 5, we need to compute f of 3. Here we can use the previously calculated value from the array to avoid a recomputation. Now f of 5 has been calculated. To calculate now f of 6, we must add f of 5 and f of 4 together. To avoid the computation of f of 4, we can just take the corresponding value out of the array, compute then f of 6 and store this value in the array. As you can see, the tree is obviously much smaller now. Let us switch now to the implementation of this function. We define the function that calculates the n Fibonacci number of the Fibonacci sequence using the memoization approach as f underline mem. This function creates an array with n plus 1 elements that are initialized to 0. Afterwards, we call the function f underline mem underline help with the input n and m and return then this value. And this helper function is nearly exactly the same function as the usual recursive Fibonacci function. The only difference here is that this function uses the array m to check whether a value has already been calculated. So when called with the input n, the function checks first if f underline mem underline help of n comma m has already been calculated. This is obviously the case if m of n is not equal to zero. In this case we return just the calculated value from the array. Otherwise we will have to calculate the corresponding value. And here we have now several cases to consider. Case 1 occurs if n is equal to zero. In this scenario we can terminate the function call with a return statement or we can overwrite the value with zero. Note that this value is zero anyway because the array has been initialized with only zeros. The next case occurs if n is equal to 1 or to 2. In these cases the corresponding output should be equal to 1. Therefore we overwrite m of n with 1 in these cases. Otherwise we calculate the value recursively and then we save this value at index n in the array. Finally we return then the value m of n. Although memoization is a great technique to optimize recursive algorithms, it can still cause a stack overflow error when dealing with large inputs. In such cases, a bottom-up approach can be used to avoid the recursion altogether and to calculate the result iteratively. This is a Python function to calculate the nth number of the Fibonacci sequence using a bottom-up approach. 
It creates an array with n plus 1 elements filled with zeros and then iteratively calculates the Fibonacci numbers starting from the base cases and returns then the last element of the array or the element on the top of the array. Therefore this approach is called bottom up. The for loop iterates over each index in the range from 0 to n plus 1 and calculates the corresponding Fibonacci number with the exception of the base cases where the value of m of i is set to either 0 or 1. Finally the function returns then the value of the nth element in the array. Now let us apply this function on a very simple example to see how this function actually works. Let's say we want to calculate the eighth Fibonacci number. The first step now is to create an array with 8 plus 1 elements, so with 9 elements containing only zeros. Now we enter the for loop. We see that i is equal to 0, so we initialize m of i with 0. Once we have done this, we increment i by 1 to the value 1. We check again whether i is equal to 0, what is no longer the case. Thus we check whether i is equal to 1 or to 2. This is true, so we initialize m of i with 1. Afterwards we increment i by 1 again to the value 2. We see similar to the previous iteration that the first if condition is not fulfilled. But the second condition is fulfilled again because i is equal to 2. From now on we will jump always to the else case because i will always be larger than 2. Here we add then the numbers at position i-1 and i-2 together and assign the value in the array at position i to the resulting value. The for loop will terminate then if n is equal to n plus 1 and we will finally return the element at the last position in the array or as you can see in the animation, the top element in the array. Although this bottom-up implementation we just saw is efficient, it still requires an array to be created to store the intermediate results. However, in some cases we may need to save even more space. In such cases, we can use a space-saving bottom-up implementation, which we will discuss next. The principle here is save only what you need. We define a function called f underline low underline space, which takes one parameter n. Then we initialize two variables, pref and cur, to 1 or to 0 respectively. We then start a for loop that iterates from 0 up to n, but not including n. Within the loop, we calculate the next Fibonacci number by adding cur and pref together and storing the result in a variable called next. We update pref and cur by setting pref to the current value of cur and cur to the current value of next. After the loop has finished, we return the value cur, which represents the end Fibonacci number. Let us consider this with an example to see how this function works exactly so that you can internalize the idea of the algorithm even better. Again we calculate the 8th Fibonacci number. We start by initializing the variable pref to 1 and the variable cur to 0. Note that if n would be equal to 0, then we would return now cur, which is equal to 0. Now we initialize the variable next as the sum of the numbers cur and pref. Afterwards we set pref to cur, so to 0, and cur to next, which is equal to 1. We see that if we had called the function with the input n equal to 1, then we would return 1, 
which corresponds to the correct value of the first Fibonacci number, so the Fibonacci number f index 1. We proceed in this way until the for loop is finished. Finally, we return the value 21, which is the value of the Fibonacci number f index 8. So far, we have considered a recursive implementation, a memoized implementation, a bottom up implementation, and a space saving bottom up implementation for the calculation of the n Fibonacci number of the Fibonacci sequence. Now, let us take a closer look at the differences in performance between these implementations. But before we do that, I want to introduce a number that appears in certain relationships between the numbers in the Fibonacci sequence. The so-called golden ratio. This number has almost magical properties. And no, I won't be discussing witchcraft with you. But interestingly enough, this number also appears in objects like in a pentagram. If you compare the blue and the red line, the green and the blue line, or the pink and the green line with each other, you will see that the ratio of these numbers is equal to the golden ratio, which is equal to approximately 1.618. The golden ratio also appears in our own bodies. If we measure, for example, the distance from our elbow to our fingertips and divide this length by the distance from our shoulder to our elbow, then we will obtain a value that is very close to the golden ratio. And the same is also true for the distance from the elbow to the wrist and the distance from the wrist to the fingertips. Despite its presence in our physical world, the golden ratio also appears in the Fibonacci sequence, where it plays a fundamental role in the growth and the structure of the sequence. You can calculate an approximation of the golden ratio by repeatedly dividing two consecutive Fibonacci numbers by each other. For instance, you could divide 1 by 1, 2 by 1, 3 by 2, 5 by 3, 8 by 5, 13 by 8, and so on. If you take larger Fibonacci numbers, you obtain a better approximation. But I don't want to go too deep in the details here. One could create a whole series about the golden ratio. Another very interesting fun fact is, for example, that you can use the Fibonacci sequence to approximate conversions between miles and kilometers, as one mile is approximately 1.6 kilometers. And we know also that the number in the Fibonacci sequence is approximately 1.6 times larger than the preceding number. So only by considering this sequence here, you can tell immediately that 5 miles are approximately 8 kilometers. 8 miles are approximately 13 kilometers. 13 miles are approximately 21 kilometers. 21 miles are approximately 34 kilometers, and so on. What's particularly interesting is that if you investigate the time complexity of the discussed Fibonacci implementations, you can prove that the time complexity of the recursive approach is in the complexity class data of phi to the power of n, where phi is again the golden ratio. So whenever you do something with the Fibonacci sequence, I'm pretty sure you will encounter the golden ratio sooner or later. While this time complexity might not be immediately apparent, it's worth noting that many articles will prove a time complexity of O of 2 to the power of n, which is a less accurate representation of the true time complexity of this function. Okay, that's it for the time complexity. For the space complexity of this algorithm, we can say that it is proportional to the maximum depth of the recursion tree, because this is the maximum number of elements that can be present in the implicit function call stack.
and we have seen that the maximum depth is proportional to the number n, hence the space complexity of the recursive Fibonacci implementation is theta of n. Compared to the recursive implementation, the memoized and the bottom-up approaches for calculating the Fibonacci numbers have a linear time and space complexity. Whenever you should only be interested in one Fibonacci number and you have to save memory, then you can use the space-saving bottom-up approach, which has also a linear time complexity, but a constant space complexity. I don't want to prove these cases here now, but I want to present some numerical results to show you how inefficient the running time of the first recursive implementation is. The x-axis represents here the input values, and the y-axis represents time in seconds. What I did here now is that I took certain integer points out of the interval from 0 to 65 and then I called our implemented functions with these input values. For every input value I measured then the time taken by my computer to calculate the result. The red points represent the running time for the recursive Fibonacci implementation. After I created the data points, I interpolated them afterwards with a cubic spline function. We see that there is a significant increase in running time after n reaches 45. For n equal to 50, the computer took about 25 minutes to calculate the Fibonacci number f index 50. This is very inefficient. Nobody wants to wait 25 minutes to obtain one Fibonacci number. For comparison, I have also investigated the memoized implementation. You can extract the necessary informations from the points colored in blue. For all inputs, my PC took less than a second. So we see that there is a significant difference in the processing time. We see that dynamic programming is an important technique for improving the performance of algorithms. Whenever you encounter repeated computations in your algorithm, it's often worth exploring whether dynamic programming can be used to optimize its execution time, especially when dealing with large input sizes. With this said, I want to conclude this video.